What can you dig at? I'm trying to get a like and get back. Tell me if you want to, you ain't been where I've been at. So Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming for one because uh, I'm pretty sure y'all could have other fun things to do today. But um, I want to just like dedicate this day for our, for not just my ancestors, but everyone, because we're all family here, you know, in one way or the other. Um, as a kid, I grew up uh, understanding history because of my family. Um, they made sure that history was very important in our family, like teaching the kids. Um, not just explaining to them, not just saying act right and what right looks like, showing it to them. Um, instead of just telling them what to do, they explained it well. And they would show it through our history on why you should carry yourself, uh, conduct yourself in um, respect so that if you show what it looks like, it'll be given to you. Um, and my life has been a roller coaster. <laughs> um, but as doing so, living through that roller coaster, I've, I've been able, when the roller coaster starts getting at the very top, get ready to pew, and it gets scary. I, honest, I honestly just remember that it's not a ride that no one else hasn't taken. So I have to carry myself in the proper form and understand that I have it. I have what it takes, everyone does. Is this that we have to tap into it. And when the chips are down, you tap into your resources, your ancestors. Uh, I'm going to start from as explaining who I am. How you doing? As in explaining who Dennis Jacob Berry is, Fontaine. When I was born, I was born with cancer. I was, as I was diagnosed, the doctor had to explain this to my mom. And my mom had already had lost my, my brother. He had a seizure, swallowed his tongue. He was only two years old. The same year I was born, she was holding me in her stomach at the time. So the same year that I was born, my brother had passed. I have another brother named Patrick Leon Green. So he's four years older than me. But in the process of me losing and now losing a brother, being born with cancer, They decided to test radiation treatment on me. It's never been done. They was trying this out, and so in the process of them figuring out if they wanted to actually do it, they were giving me steroids to make sure that my body was developed enough to be able to take what they're getting ready to do. So at eight months old, they had a neuroblastoma. Um, after that, I went through like 12 years in and out of the hospital, constantly in and out of hospitals doing tests and stuff. They wanted to see how it was affecting me, but they, they, the cancer was gone. After that, after that surgery, the cancer was gone. So that was a blessing from the jump, you know, 
And me having that story right there was just the beginning of my journey. At three years old, my father was murdered. Some would say he was in the wrong place, wrong time, but he was stabbed in the back. And so as that went on, I had I moved to California and so on and lived in California and seen things that wasn't supposed to be able to see as a child. Witnessed things and experienced, lived in a lifestyle that I shouldn't have had to experience. But at the same time, who am I? I'm just a kid. I go through all of that. I have ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. Through school, I was like well-known, popular kid at school. Everybody liked me or whatever, good energy. I didn't have any problems um, as far as school went. But then as I got older and I, we moved from Texas at the age of 16, I moved to Arizona. My life started changing more. I started getting out the house, um, having different type of friends. But then I started getting in trouble with the law because of my association with people, because I didn't see wrong in people. I felt like everybody has a chance to prove their self right or wrong. Don't judge a book by the cover. I've been judged before. I've been pulled over and arrested and for wrongfully accused at ages 16, 17, 18, 19. Each time I'm, I'm going to jail is for something that I didn't do. And I didn't understand why this was happening. I didn't do anything, but yet I was and it was just mistaken identity. We all look alike. It was, it was just weird to me because I grew up, I was thinking that racism wasn't really an issue. And not that it wasn't a real issue, but it was one that we can deal with, that we've been dealing with. But it doesn't, but I didn't realize that it didn't, it only happened that it didn't necessarily mean that because I had it easy, it wasn't gonna get rocky. Then I started going back into my history. When I get incarcerated, I get locked, I got locked up. I did seven months in the county jail. In that time, I thought about my ancestors and why was I incarcerated? trying to find a reason. When I turned 20, I'm missing, I'm losing, I'm living out a lot of stuff because it's not really, what we're here for is not really about all of the bad things that happened to me. It was the fact that I made it out of it. I was literally incarcerated for 18 years of my life. I got accused for, it started off as three murders and it went into capital murders. Then it went into capital murders, kidnappings, armed robberies. It just got uglier and uglier, all because of me being at the wrong place at the wrong time, just saying hi to someone. And that person able to say, yeah, I, I met this person right here. And then boom, now you're stuck with this person and something that's so hideous to, to someone like me because I know better. Okay. So now I was incarcerated at the time and wondering why I'm Incarcerated? Why? What did I do? And 
Of course, a lot of other people have been victims for things that they didn't do. But I never thought that I would be one of them. And not to this magnitude. And I would always call her on the phone and talk to her. And she would give me encouragement. And let me know that uh, there's nothing that I can't handle. And that I'm not doing it by myself. I have something to fight for. I have two kids. I have two sons. Tyler and Dominique. So that was my strength. I talk to God all the time, ever since I was ever since I was born. So I always have this conversation with him about since my father was killed at the, in, you know, when I was three, I said, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna leave my kids on this planet without without them having a chance to meet their father, to talk to him, hear his voice, see how he thinks. Because I didn't get that opportunity. So that guy is incarcerated and he's talking to God and he's saying, well, you was reckless a little bit. And he's saying, you can make the best of this because I'm saving you from yourself and from the world. But while I'm doing this time, I need to work on myself. I need to stop complaining. I need to stop. Don't think like the rest of the world is thinking. That's it. And that was the simplest thing that I did, was realizing that it's not no one's fault. If we take responsibility for the company that we keep, to take responsibility, birds of a feather flock together. Not saying that there's no purpose for everyone, but to make sure that you know who you are first. And I didn't know who I was. I didn't, I, I kind of like drifted off from, away from that. I didn't understand that the real purpose for me is to counsel, talk to people, to share my experiences, not to hide it or to be ashamed of it. I'm sitting up here crying like a baby, right? <laughs> but I'm okay with it because I believe, I know that someone is gonna be able to see this. I'm like, man, he been through all of that? I'm amazed because now I'm looking back at my life all the time, all the time. And I'll be like, I talk to God, I'll be like, wow, you let me make it through a lot of stuff. I got a story. I'm like, this is an adventure for me. I'm now excited about life. I'm, all, I'm like, it's always been an adventure for me. And it's like, I don't know what the next page is gonna be. I started writing books and then started realizing that, oh, wait a minute, that's what your family does. Your family write things. They create, they, they're into journalism. It's, they share with people, they counsel. Everything that I was doing naturally, my, all my friends, everyone that I know at some point in time talk to me and share with me and they know it's not going anywhere. And they know that when, after they leave me, they're gonna leave better. Better. Not that I have the answers because I don't never tell no one that they have the answer, that I have the answer, because they have the answer. They just have to be honest with themselves. Just be honest with yourself. And once I started doing that and to, to learn, to be honest with myself is to learn myself and, and to learn myself is knowledge. So, and I learned that knowledge is really the key. It's literally the key. The more knowledge you have, the more power you have, the more power you have with yourself. I'm not trying to control no one else because you're concerned about yourself and making sure that you're in line with, your, with yourself so that you can be more and more proud of yourself. 
So I started doing that while I was incarcerated. I made sure that I didn't waste any time. I stayed in school. I didn't socialize with people that I knew that wasn't on the same wavelength as me, right? Not that I was thinking down better than them, but I had better things to do with my time. I controlled my whole environment. And it, it worked for me. I worked for the wardens. I did artwork while I was in prison. I'd learned different skills. Um, I studied medicine. I studied psychology. I studied history. I studied theology. And it was exciting for me. I studied history on a day-to-day -day basis. I used to, everything that I seen as a child, my grandfather, because every day that I would come over to his house, I remember having, he having all these um, a mail that he just got in early in the morning and they would be stacked up on the table and it happened every day, it was consistent. He was that important. And I was like, wow, it was amazing to me. I didn't, couldn't imagine anyone having that many people concerned about anything he has to say. That many people? and I. And as I got older, I, now I understand why he had all that mail and how important he really was. And all of them were. Every last one of my grandfathers, my, every one of the Fontaines have, was creators. It was into music, business, politics, religion. It was just, you know, just, it was just it's just amazing. And as I'm, I'm still digging, Excuse me, sorry. I'm, I'm still digging through all of the information and it's mind blowing. To me, when I think of Black Wall Street, I think, wow, we had Black Wall Street in Austin, Texas. And this is like 18, what, 1855, 1860, 1870. They were building businesses, black owned community right here. And that was, and that's big. I'm like, because people, we're just still just like really glorifying black wall street just now. And you know what I mean? Just now we just really kind of giving it the recognition and it's exciting to people. It's exciting to black people because we're like, wow, that shows how great we could be in a short period of time. If we, if we could just be great, we don't have, we can pull up our bootstraps, get into business and really support each other. And we can have everything that we need. We don't have to complain. We don't have to ask for nothing. We can actually have it. And that's what Black Wall Street meant to us when, we, when everybody started finding out about it and really started pushing, promoting it. But as I'm looking into my grandfather's history and the history of Austin, because he wasn't by himself, he didn't do it by himself. But Black Wall Street was 1920 something. Just imagine if we thought, if we knew about 1800s of how great we became straight out of the field, straight out the field. We instantly got to the business. We instantly started creating wash, uh, laundromats, grocery stores, uh, publications. You know, we started getting into education. We started getting into religion, medicine. We started understanding this stuff, getting into politics. All of that was instant. My grandfather died in 1898. He was born in 1808. That's 90 years. At 55, at 57, he was, the emancipation hit. So that means like within like what, 35 years? All of this stuff was done by one man motivating and pushing and getting the community involved. And like I said, I'm still, I'm, I'm a team player. I know he didn't do it by himself. So just imagine how many great people was great right then and then that history was just frozen and put in a block, it seemed like. Because we needed to hear this and we've been needing to hear this information.
And, I, and it's not just Texas history, it's American history. And that's what's so exciting to me because I'm, I want to, I want him, I want his, his accomplishments and other accomplishments to be a motivating force for the people of color today because we need it. We need it. It's no time to, to point fingers. Now it's time to do. It's time to do something. You know? And I'm not, no, I'm not into politics or anything. I'm an artist. You know, I just like to express myself. And I love, I love people. And I love the fact that I know that I'm not here for myself. I'm here for everyone. I'm here, everyone is here for each other. It's no, <laughs> literally. And, but we don't, we kind of get lost in looking out instead of in. We, our projection is off. And because we see so much and we hear so much and we're so sensitive to the outer, we wind up being numb to our inner sides. And when we do that, we lose ourselves. And I've seen it over and over. And I'm happy that I've had the experience and I've met the people that I have, the, my family members that I've met, um, the friends that I've, I've uh, connected with. Um, it's just amazing. But that's what motivated me to write my book. My book, Supercell, it's based off of a, a cancer survivor such as myself. It's a, a, a cancer survivor named Bessman, and Bessman goes through a whole adventure. There you go. Thank you so much, Jennifer. This is Supercell. But this is, the, this is one of a series of books. You know, we got my little picture back here, you know. But yeah, it's a, it's a great book though. But the funny thing about this book, I wrote it maybe 30 years ago while I was in prison. And when, when someone tells you that you got 18 years Any type of time, someone is just taking it from you, and they say, and it's a lie. It's not like it's something that you deserve, like you worked hard for. Just give you something, and they told you that they don't care if you did it or not. Two is better than one. So, at that time, I was like, well, I need to do some with my time. Because I know I'm, I'm going to make it out of here, and I, I have kids, and I, I need to be there for them, and that's going to be my strength. I knew that my grandfather was going to pass before I make it out. I knew it. We talk on the phone, me and my grandfather. He's like, well, you know, he's like, but you know, life is life. He would you know he. If I didn't, if. If I didn't understand what death was and what life was, then it would have been harder. It had really been harder for me. And I'm a firm believer in God. He knows what's good, what's safe for you, what's, you know. And in knowing the journey that you're gonna have to go through, the sacrifice is gonna be made but relishing the moments that you have with your loved ones and know that they're still there as long as you can remember them and you can keep them in your heart. So, my grandfather passed while I was incarcerated, like 2002, I think. Right after that, my mom passed while I'm incarcerated. 
And like I said, I knew it was, it was a possibility. It's not something that you want though, but you have to prepare yourself. So I did. Um, but I had to make a vow to myself at that moment that I was gonna make sure that I'm better. When I get out, I'm gonna be better, I'm be great. I'm not gonna complain. I learned so much stuff, man, it's crazy. I didn't, for, and it was for recreation. I studied so much law that they had to change law because I was gonna beat them while I was incarcerated. So they held my, my emotions and everything so that they could keep me incarcerated. They wanted to make sure they kept me incarcerated the whole time because if they let me out, then this admitting, this admission. So I did all my time and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna be great. I'm gonna write books, I'm gonna do music, I'm gonna be an artist, I'm gonna act, whatever God says that I can do, I'm gonna do it. And at the same time, I wanna let everybody else know that they can do it. That's it. And I'm leading by example. It's very few people that I know that can, that's been through what I've been through. And I haven't even told y'all half of the stuff. You know, but it's not about that. It's the fact that I'm here and I'm able to connect with the people that are that have going through things and thinking that they're the long ranger that they have nobody else has been through this and they're able to be successful. Nobody had their foot on your neck and then you can get up out from under it and be a champion. Well, I'm gonna be one of them. And uh ah. I'm so, uh, I'm excited. I'm glad for y'all. I'm glad for everyone here. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad that y'all came. It's my birthday. I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm tired of these tears. I want to smile and laugh. Uh, but the good thing about it is these tears are not sad. These are not sad tears. I don't want no one to think that I'm sad about this. Everything is a blessing. I'm not supposed to be here, but yet I'm here. That lets you know that there is a creator. I'm excited. If y'all have any questions y'all want to? Oh, yes. I want to hear more about your artwork and your music. Oh, okay. Uh, well, my artwork. Oh, let me get my art. I got a book. Go here. I'll be right back. Jennifer, I checked some of your work out too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Jennifer, yeah, we got to talk. But this is my book, Out of the Box. Now, this is the first of its kind, right? NFTs just came out. You know, it's kind of fairly new, about three years, four years old. But um, me and my, my sister, my, my partner, um, Angela, she had... Uh, me and her, we started studying NFTs, non-fungible tokens. For, if you didn't know, that's what they are, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Oh, it's, a, um, it's like a digital entity, entity to where you can um, uh, kind of like copyright your uh, intellectual properties, you know. But this is some of my artwork my little paintings and stuff. Y'all can check it out. Uh, <laughs> I, got, uh, I got something for everybody, you know, just, just expressing myself. Um, just mixed artwork. But every last one of these pieces are NFT. They're all digital. So the thing about that is they're like one of a hundred. So everybody can buy one of a hundred and they'll wind up having a, their own personal copyright of this, of whatever image that they choose. 
and then they can trade them, sell them, um, collect them, wait until I get so famous, you know, when I get into about a billionaire, I get to a billionaire, whatever you buy from me, you know, somebody's going to be trying to cop it from you. They're going to be like, yo, you got one of those? They don't even have them no more. Hey, I got you. Yeah, so I have, oh, I have all types of different designs and stuff. But, um, but also, uh, I've done, I've done murals, uh, while I was incarcerated in the state of Mississippi, I had a chance. That's why I really um, realized that I was an artist while I was incarcerated. As a kid, I didn't know I was an artist I, or, or had a desire to be. I didn't, no, I, no, I'm not going to say I didn't have a desire to be. I might have fantasized about it as a kid or whatever, you know, you know, going to France and having that little hat that kicked to the side, you know, like, yeah. And with the, with the mustache, you know, but but I never knew that I was an artist, and I got incarcerated and got put in a room. You never realize how well you get to know yourself when you're in a box by yourself. I'm talking about literally when you have to talk to yourself and kind of like, so what are you gonna do today? And then you answer it. You're like, oh, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. Okay, cool. All these years that they were saying that don't answer yourself, you, you'd be crazy. Ah, oh, that was the wrong, that was a lie. You're not crazy for talking to yourself and answering yourself. You really can figure out some things if you actually listen to yourself. I'm, I'm like, man, I should've been listening to you the whole time. I'm like, man, I was told not to listen to you. <laughs> they said you was crazy. <laughs> no, but um, yeah. That's when I learned, I learned art. I was like, I was just doodling and stuff. And I have a real cool story that, but it's kind of it's spiritual because I was incarcerated and I was on the phone with my mom and I was complaining about getting out. I was like, have you talked to my lawyer, this and that, blah, blah, blah. She's like, yeah, I talked to your lawyer. You said everything's gonna be okay. I was like, yeah, oh, wow, cool, cool, cool. So when I'm getting out, she's like, just a little bit, just pray about it. I'm like, the lawyer told you it's going to be okay, pray about it. I'm like, what What day is that? So I'm like, all right, okay. She's like, just go and pray about it. Talk to God, you know what I'm saying? Tell him what you want and everything will be cool. I said, I don't have no, she's like, be, be patient. I'm like, I don't have any patience. I'm, I'm only 18 years old. So she's like, Pray for patience then. She's real stern, you know. She's like, just pray for patience then. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go and do that. So she said, when you get out the phone, go pray for patience. So I go to my cell. After I get out the phone with her, I go straight to my cell and I start talking to God. I'm like, I need patience. Cause I, I wanna get out today. You said I'm gonna get out, but I don't know when. I don't wanna get out today. So God was like, oh, all right. He didn't say nothing to me, but I'm, I'm assuming why. Right. So I finished talking to him. I go out into the day room, and there's some uh, some Hispanic guys, and they're drawing. They're sitting at the table, and they're just drawing on envelopes and stuff. And I was like standing over them. I was like, wow. I was so amazed at the artwork that they were doing. It was amazing. They were doing collages because some of them couldn't speak English. But their but their wife could could uh, couldn't uh, read Spanish. They can speak Spanish, but they might not be able to uh, read it. So th the way that they would communicate with each other is they would draw pictures of what they're missing in their love and everything, the kids, their car. You know, it was just a, a big collage. It was so it was sick. It was like wow. So I was giving them their props and everything and telling them that I like their, their, their work and how much that I wish that I could do it. I'm like, I wish I could do that. Wow, that is sick. I wish I could do that. And the guy just looked up at me. He said, you can, that's it. You can. I'm like, man, I can't do that. No, that's real artwork. And he was like, man, just get you a pencil, get you some paper, and get you a magazine and just find a picture that you like and draw everything that you see. He said, let your eyes and your hands connect. 
I'm like, man, I ain't got nothing else to do. All right, I'm gonna try it out. I'm gonna show you. I can't. I, my pitch ain't gonna be nothing like that. You know? So I went and did exactly what he said. I went and got a National Geographic book, and it had a, a bobcat. It was a perfect picture of a bobcat. The, the cameraman was right in his face like this. You could see everything, the whiskers, each hair. You could see the cameraman glare in the eyes. It was just amazing. So I, I looked at it, and I was like, I'm going to try that out. I like this. I have no clue that I'm, what I'm going to do. I'm like, OK. So I just went at it. Some time goes by. You know how you notice people standing over you and everything, like watching over your shoulder? So I just kept on doing that. Every now and then, somebody might come and look, and then they'll leave. So I'm still drawing. Count time. So you got to go to your cell. Go to your cell, get, get counted in. And then after that, I ran back down there to draw, do my drawing. So I run down there. After I get satisfied enough, I took it, and I was like, That's pretty good, you know what I mean? So I, I ran over to, to the table, to the art table with the guys and everything. I was like, yo, look. And he's like, he's like, who'd you do that? He said, who'd you do that for you? I said, I did. He was like, oh, nah, man, nah, you didn't do that. You didn't do that. Nah, man, stop playing. I'm like, for real. And then a guy that was that been watching me the whole time drawing was standing over me. He vouched for me. He was like, yeah, man, I've been watching him for hours. When he said it was like four hours, I was like, how long was that to draw this? He's like, man, at least four hours, man. Yeah, we went through counts and everything. I was like, there go my patience. My patience. It was answered right then. And it didn't take long either. Because I just got a phone with my mom. She told me to pray. And I was like, oh, I'm going to try it out. OK, OK, I'm going to try it. I prayed and then went back to the day room. And someone told me, taught me a trick on how to find patience through your skill. Whatever your gift is, that's your patience. Because time would just not exist when you're in what you like doing, what God gave you. Stay in that space and time doesn't exist. That's how I made 18 years. Through art, writing, writing music. I have over like 600 songs. That hasn't been recorded yet, <laughs> but they're written. Uh, I've written, I got books, like, I got a good, about nine books and a series. And, and the series is like four books by itself, five books. But that's what I did with my time. I went to school. Got my got GEDs and welding degrees and plumbing and just all this different stuff, you know what I mean? Because I knew idle time leads to an idle mind. I can't waste it. I can't waste it. Because I got to be better. Got to. Yes, ma'am. How much time do you have still a lot of family in the Austin area? <sighs> Over the, okay, like my mom and my grandfather were really the only ties that I had to, to my family as far as the Fontaines go. My mom, when she had, when, after she had me, well, really when she, she had my brother when she was 16. So at that time, she was so ashamed that she left the family. She she just left the family. She left Austin. No, she stayed in Austin, but she just disconnected herself with the family because she was ashamed and she was embarrassed and you know, 
all these all type of emotions and stuff. But, but in doing so, um, I was like, we were, our family was like in and out. We was traveling a lot. My cancer was a big issue uh, because she was dealing with that. So she really didn't and you know how families are and stuff, a little in and out. So she was more focused on making sure that I go to my checkups and all this stuff. I had a specialist named Dr. Bessemer from India. He flew, he, you know, he moved, uh, relocated his whole family to Austin and became an Austinite behind, you know, helping me survive through cancer. He's a, a cancer specialist. He has family here. But yeah, um, I don't have no connections to my family, really. My Uncle Lambert um, was the only person that I was connected to when I got released in 2012. Um, and I hadn't talked talk to him since my grandfather had passed. Uh, we would talk on the phone and everything, but other than that, I haven't talked to him at all um, since there. Uh, Did you find out about your family's Great, great, great grandfathers. Uh, history as an adult, as a child, were you, did you, was that a family kind of thing, or was it later on when you got to be 30, 40 years old, and everybody really started painting a picture of um, no, um, this way in Central Texas and stuff? Oh, okay. Well, um, I was born here in Austin, Texas, and I, and I was born in Brackenridge Hospital. Uh, yeah, and so, um, and I lived on, off of 12th Street in Chicago, whatever, 12th and Chicago? Yeah, um, my Wells Street, whatever, my Wells uh, store. Um, so I used to walk to my grandfather's house. He stayed off of Pennsylvania. So I used to walk through, all the way up there, go to, go to his house every morning. So he would talk to me all the time and he would tell me so much stuff about my, my family. And I'm like nine years old at the time. Um, nine, 10, no, I was nine, eight or nine. I had just came back from California because I lived, we moved to California when my, grand, when my dad died when I was three. We had moved to California to deal with whatever it had, my mom had to deal with, his paperwork or whatever. But we came back to Texas when I was like eight or nine. And that's when I, I really, that was when I really was influenced of how a man stands and how, what, how a dignified gentleman look. Because my grandfather, I never seen him out of a suit. So it was, you know, so to me, that's that's a man that he was the son of your great grand. Yes, yes, ma'am. He's he's the third. Isaiah Jacob Isaiah Jacob Fontaine. He's the he's the third. Well, he's the third generation, but he's really the baby. He's the baby out of out of the boys. because um, he has other brothers. And all of them were great. All of them created something, you know. Um, but that was when I, like, I really had, you know, God, I just respected my grandfather so much by how he carried himself, his demeanor. He talked to me as a grown-up all the time. He never, he always called me Jacob. And, and when he would call me Jacob, he gave me the history of who Jacob was. And in doing that, because Jacob is his grandfather, you know, and when he did that, when, when they gave me Jacob, they gave me Jacob for a reason. And he kind of groomed me in a, in a, in a way and at that very moment when he shared with me of why you're a Jacob and why you have to be strong and, you know, and before he even passed, man, we just would talk on the phone and he would still be that same way. He would still teach me the way of the church. He would still give me, he would still send me 
copyrighted paperwork of his uh, how he groomed churches, how was his how he was taught to groom a church, to build a, a sanctuary for the community. It was he, the, he has they have a strategic way of doing things, and my grandfather used to talk to me and uh, let me know that this is bigger than just me. That I can't move and do just whatever I want. I have to first be mindful of God. And I understood that. You know, and that's, I, I'm forever grateful for that because through all my journeys, I always knew how to stand properly to get respect. You know, um, because I give it. Um, I'm just forever, you know, grateful for that. Yeah, I, I'm not a teacher, but I have a lot of respect for teachers because they, the role they play, children, what they do, those children, and, yeah. you know, it makes them what they are. Yes, ma'am. You know, as adults. And... Um, my uh, great grandfather was not as powerful as yours, but I think that how in that church that he helped found in 1860, whatever year that was, the generations, all those generations below. And how that that person, that one person, or the group of men that may have founded that church, how they influenced all of the generations down, 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 down. Yeah. And all those people, mm-hmm. not just him and how he, who he was as a man, although he, he was just a man. Yes. But all the, and that's why I ask that they tell you well, your great grandfather was instrumental in organizing 20 churches over there and 10 churches of you know, in this region. Did they do that at an early age, or did you later on really get the impact of how powerful one, that one person could have created the problems as a pioneer in a community? And, you know, it goes down. Right. You didn't hear the name. It's not as if the name was on. Street, in right? Austin or street. Mm-hmm. You know they didn't, they didn't do it. Like that. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you're definitely right. Thank you. Yeah, you're definitely right. Yeah, you get a street. Yeah, yeah. See, that's why I asked when we were growing up. Was it really, really explained to you the level of impact? creating churches in a community because that's that you know churches were the focal point in mm-hmm. communities. Right. That's where everybody got together, the politics yes, as right. well as the church. Right. Uh, yeah. They didn't keep to the slave on in life. No, I, I actually um I think I was in third grade. We got we um we was put on the news. Um at this cemetery or What's the other cemetery? Evergreen. Uh, oh, it was, I think it's Evergreen because my aunt, um, my aunt Nunu Ang Ninety, they lived across the street from the cemetery. Evergreen. Yes, ma'am. They had a house right, like, like the third house from. It used to be a, a, a Exxon gas station. Mm-hmm. Well, my aunt Nunu Ang Ninety, they lived the second house or the third house yeah, next. Uh, Yes, ma'am. So, but they had um, gathered all of all of the Fontaines up, all of us, and they put us in a newspaper and on the news. They had did a big thing on, at the cemetery, and they documented the whole family. Because a lot of people I don't know. I was only I was like nine like nine years old at the time, eight or nine. Uh, so I don't, 
I don't know. I just that's when I recognized that my family is like really, oh. yeah. And all my life, like being a wandering around Austin, going from church to church, because I stayed in church all my life. Uh, so I, St. John, I, um, all of these churches, I was considered um, because of who I, who my father was, who my grandfather was, type of thing. So I kind of understood that it was some history. It was some, it was some deep history. And then I understand the organized part of, um, of my grandfather, um, being a Mason, being Freemason and stuff like that. So it's, and that's a whole nother way of me getting, being uh, recognized um, ever since I was a little kid. So yeah, um, I always kind of, I always was able or knew that um, the history of our family of my grandfather and stuff, and the, our library. Uh, we had a li uh, library that my, our family supported and you know, supplied and everything. It was a lot of property and stuff that I, I kind of got like little bits and pieces of. But mind you, I'm still in. The, I was still in and out of the hospital doing treatments and stuff. And being in California for that point of time in my life, so it wasn't really too much of. Oh, when I moved to Lamplight Village, meaning that I left the East Side because the East Side I was well, you know, surrounded by people that were familiar with who I, who my family was. But when I moved to North Austin, it was just me. <laughs> so it was a whole different uh, ball game. Um, and I, we stayed there until I was like 16, and then I moved to Arizona and to take care of my other aunts, my Aunt Hattabelle and my Aunt Moselle, uh, with my mom, because my mom's a nurse, so she always took care of the family. Um, yeah, but I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure. Yeah, you did. A lot of families... don't share as much as they should about their history. Yeah. Um, and that was the case. And some don't have a full picture of how some of their families you know, have been instrumental in you know, developing pioneers and communities. They just get together. Right. You know, to talk about things. And we have the advantage of digital type communication nowadays we didn't have a lot of pictures to say oh this is a this is a right so that mm. people in my generation we don't really have a picture of these folks that everybody that we heard about we didn't we don't really we didn't really get the true story of it mm. and never had a chart in front of us to say okay this is who this is this is who this is this, this is how it comes down to this Oh, definitely, definitely. I remember, like, and I, that's a, you bringing that up takes me back to when I was a kid, knowing that my father passed away when I was three, and knowing that my mom only had a, a, a obituary, a little, uh, pamphlet or whatever and a picture a couple pictures just like two or three pictures one of them was him in the casket don't want to see that <laughs> but but I was I, I, I as a kid I felt some kind of way that why it's like that's sad you know what I mean that I I don't have any pictures of my my father like well I'm just looking in the mirror you know that's the best way I can give you and my mom had had a couple pictures but my mom's gone, you know, her property and everything. My brother kept for what he could or whatever, and that dwindled or whatever. But other than that, it's like my life and, and all of that, I still look as a testimony because I'm not the only one that's records has been scattered all over the world. You know, so I'm not, 
I'm not alone, there's comfort in it and there's strength in it because I know that um, it's bigger than that. You know, I'm bigger than that. The universe is bigger than that. God is bigger than that. So, but yeah, I, I, I dreaded that when, you know, when you run that up, I was like, yeah, it's, it is sad, but that was my whole purpose. Of, that gave me more strength to be here for my kids. I got six grandkids now. I just had um, uh, my granddaughter named Skylar. She was just born June the 26th. I am stoked. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. I was like, wow, it's... When, in, just historically, and we're just talking in general, mm -hmm. um, the disbursements of families back even during slavery, <coughs> you know, you go this way, you go this way, you go this way. Mm -hmm. um, that's where how I kind of saw it ended up here talking to Jennifer because um, I'd been doing some genealogical kind of stuff by tree, not by DNA. Right, right, right. I guess my point is we we all are guilty of not sharing information about generations you know, before us. But we as it eliminates the ability to network <laughs> oh. in a oh, yeah. to say, well, you know, uh, you have an auntie that lives over, you have some relatives your name means something over there in the East Coast. Right. That person might be able to help you, you know, you have relatives there. But mm -hmm. if you don't, and it's big time, it's always been in other cultures that they network with each other, knowing who your family is and what kind of roots you have in Austin, Texas. Well, you may not know anybody here, but you can always drop it and say, well, no. You know, I didn't grow up here, but my grandfather did this, and my grandfather did somebody said, oh yeah, and then before you know it, you got a job. Yeah, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. Hey. It's about knowing the history sometimes, you know, but we all share our history. Oh, definitely, definitely. You just reminded me, um, <laughs> me, and, me and my partner, uh, Angela, we had went to the library and we, what is the library? Yeah, she had went to the library and she pulled uh, some records that my grandfather from 18, 18 something, right? Uh, what was it? What was the name? 18, 1890. 1890. Mm -hmm. And it was, I'm perfect records. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about perfect, different names, last names, such and such, such. He, mm -hmm. Just perfect. And I was like, wow, look at that. Look how easy that was. Mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. just. Everybody that he married, I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of people, he, couples that he had married. And it was just, wow. Mm -hmm. And look at how shabby the records have been kept. You keep your own records nice, but when somebody else do it for you, it's, yeah. you know. But just like Jennifer said, our records have been preserved, she had, told, she had said once before, she was like, our record, you know, as far as whites, their records were kept pretty good. But when it got to the, the slaves, the records were shabby and, you know, scattered around and unorganized or missing completely. But now I'm like, what's our excuse now? Let's make some records. Let's start keeping yes. records right now. Let's start right now. And that's why I'm like, my family's gonna get it. You know, I, if I have to start from right now, the record's straight now. You know, if, you know I got six grandkids, <laughs> two boys, they still working, they still, you know. I'm like, I'm gonna start my legacy right here. If I have to start over, you know, but I'm, I'm only piggybacking 
those who were great before us. And they can pay it back off of what they know. Yeah. That their great, great, great grandfather was such and such a person. Exactly. And like, since I've been here, like I've been back and forth sending my kids information about their grandfathers. Like, yo, this is what, this is how great you are. This is what you, this is the material you can be made out of. This is not, this, these are people that didn't com just sit here and complain. They did something. They did something. They didn't ask, just sit up there and just ask for a handout. They kind of like, well, I'm, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to do some influence and we're going to do some voting. We're going we're gonna to do some sit downs and have some conversations. And like you said, the church was a sanctuary. It was a place to where you can sit down and get your thoughts together. Get your bearings right. Ask some questions. Get some directions. Learn. My grandfather had a news, his newspaper was hilarious. I was like, that was brilliant. Because he had the one, he, it wasn't just literary, it wasn't just literature, it was pictures. It was, you know, he was strategic. He was like, he was understanding. He was sensitive to the times. He knew that everybody wasn't gonna be able to just automatically know all of these words. So he was giving a little something for everybody. And then he was trying to connect the dots, like you said. He was charging, what is it, a dime, I think? Send me a dime and, and who you're trying to connect with. Because they was fresh out of slavery. People scattered, like you said, scattered all over the place. They're trying to connect with their family, their loved ones. And all they have maybe a name, a nickname, a, a symbol, a gesture. Like, just draw a cane and they'll, she'll recognize me. But that, that's amazing to, at that time, at that time to, to be like, okay, well, we need these. These are the things that we need. We need, and it was one, two, three. It was step by step. And we're going to give them a little bit and something to go on. Something's better than nothing. I know that nowadays something don't mean nothing. <laughs> it's like, oh, I need more than that. <laughs> I need more than that. But that's where we need to be at. Be content. But yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Do I have any, any more questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Have you tried um, searching for information on your family from places like Ancestry.com? I haven't did, I haven't did you know, Ancestral .com or anything like that, but, um, but really it was just skimming, and I really didn't find anything too much. And I've went far as back as France. Um, Edward Fontaine and his father, and it gets deep. It gets to where it turns him from a slave to a servant. And these are things that was told to me from my grandfather that tied in. So, and I it, it started asking a lot of other questions and I'm working on trying to filter through that because I think that's a whole nother story that, you know, just an idea to look at on what is the, what is the outline, the real outline of Jacob Fontaine. His name was Tuttle before that, um, before when he was traded through slavery. So it gets real deep, you know, it, it makes you kind of wonder like, one, my grandfather was, had to be like highly educated to be able to run with a guy that's the secretary of the president. Um, and we already know that assistants or uh, slaves or whatever, they do what they're told to do. And it's not really too much work to do if you're a politician besides paperwork, passing, writing laws and um, drawing up documents and stuff like that. 
So that would lead me to how great my grandfather was because it showed how much education that he actually had because he had to practice law. He had to understand and study law to even just to be the assistant of Mr. Edward Fontaine, period. He had to understand what these laws and these documents is that he's holding in his hands and that he has to write. So that puts me in a, a realm of, well, he was ministering at the time, um, at one point in time, or either or, Samuel Houston. And, you know, so it's just like, okay, so that's, that's a big figure here, you know. So it's like, okay, so you were able to be in reach to talk and drop a seed to influence and help understand what humanity is to someone that can influence the world. So I think that's great. Um, I can go on and on about <laughs> um, of the possibilities and what's not being said yet. And I'm still studying it so that I can, when I say it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be more confident about what's going on. <laughs> but I love it. I, I'm, I love that it's so many people such as you guys that are inter interested enough to, and, and familiar and, and can see to appreciate and to love what's going on and what history is and and appreciate and know that we're great. So, you know, it's just, it's just amazing for me. I just, thank you for coming again.